Good afternoon. Uh, today's session will be uh, conducted by Christy Christensen, Debbie Bowles, Melanie Burton, and myself, Steve Audi. Um, uh, you've met some of the other presenters in uh, the Monday session and the Wednesday, Wednesday session. Um, a little background on myself since I didn't attend either of those. Um, I've been uh, supporting Ginny May for uh, approximately 20 years um, and conducting these trainings for about 10 of those years. Um, I, I'm involved in the uh, single family, uh, uh, multifamily, single family, and a little bit on the data disclosure piece. All right. To recap uh, session two from Wednesday, um, we, we wanna know what you saw as important from that session. And if you could pull up your chat box and type in any takeaways from session two, any unresolved questions you had from session two, or if you had any from session one, you can include those. Um, and so you can you can begin with your your chats now um, from takeaways from session two and unresolved questions. I'll give you a few minutes to put those in there. All right, we have our first save and summarize your pool. Thank you, Curry. Another good one, the workflow chart, super helpful. Yes, that is one of the fan favorites. The four different record types, very good. Thank you, Mary. And feel free to, to add any open questions um, in, in the chat as well as, as important takeaways. We want to get your feedback from, from these sessions so we can, we can know what's effective and what you're, what you're looking for for training. Okay, um, we'll we'll continue on now. But if you if you have any other takeaways or unresolved questions, um, that chat box is open for the entire training session. So um, continue to uh, put your comments in there. All right, on Wednesday session, um, we discussed how to edit and correct records. Um, we went over the calculations performed by RFS and noted which fields the issuers are required to report. Um, exception feedback was covered and navigation to the different access points um, within MGM. How to retrieve and download files was covered and what the preferred method was um, uh, for downloading. We reviewed the file submission and reviewed if the file was accepted or rejected. Okay, in today's session, um, we're gonna focus on those last two bolded items, uh, the additional reporting requirements, and cash and reconciliation. All right, let's get started with additional reporting requirements. 
Now, in terms of ob objectives, uh, in this module, we will review these monthly reporting requirements and the quarterly reporting requirements, and we'll explain the timeline for additional reporting requirements. Okay, uh, under additional reporting requirements, uh, the prepayment penalties, uh, the top one, must be reported by 7 p.m. Eastern time on the fourth business day of the month. Um, our, our, the second item there, monthly reporting certification opens on the 10th business day with the completion being 7 p.m. Eastern time on the 14th business day. Uh, loan matching and suspense uh, should be worked monthly. Uh, it's a monthly process. And the CAVs and WIFIT are reported quarterly. Um, the annual financial documents are done yearly, once a year. Um, what I'd like to do here is in the chat box, uh, type the number of uh, one through six here of any of those that you um, perform for your organization. So if you do prepayment penalties, calves and annual, you, you do one, four, and six. So let, let's see in the chat box who, who does what for their organization. Okay, thank you, Donna. One through five. Thanks, Mary. Very good. Thanks, Bonnie. Two, three, and four. Good. Okay. Moving on from there. So the prepayment penalties, as I mentioned before, must be reported by 7 p.m. Eastern time on the fourth, fourth business day of the month. However, they may be reported as early as the first business day. Okay. Um, what you see on the screen here is the multifamily um, the pool accounting multifamily screen and uh, the multifamily division promotes that the prepayment penalty should be reported prior to 7 p.m. on the second business day. It's uh, a best practice um, there. This ensures that the prepayment penalties are on your initial pre-collection notice. This is definitely a help to you. Uh, to report the prepayment penalty manually in RFS, uh, navigate to the pool accounting multifamily screen. Okay. Um, then from there, you click on the prepayment penalty tab and you get this screen. Uh, you, Im you input the prepayment penalty amount and the payment date. Those are the two on the row just below that red box. Okay, you may notice that there's a new field on the screen. That's the one in red. Uh, a new RFS enhancement on the prepayment screen is for the loan UPB. 
which is populated from field 23 on the loan record. Um, and next slide, I'll explain why this field has been added um, to RFS. Okay, these will be added uh, for each pool um, in your portfolio. Also, once all of your prepayment penalties are entered, you should click on the download in the blue bar and export all of your prepayment penalties to a CSV or an Excel file. You can use this so that you can compare your pre-collection notice for balancing. And as a reminder, it's your responsibility to review your final pre-collection to ensure that the pre-collection penalty amounts are correct for what you reported in RFS compared to what is on your final pre-collection notice, which is posted on the sixth business day. So again, this download is a great way to ensure that you have reported all of the prepayment penalties for the current month and the total prepayment penalty amount balances to your final pre-collection notice. Okay, and as always, uh, if you have any questions, you can, you can pop those in the chat. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there is that new field, Loan UPB, on the screen. Um, the enhancement was to add that field was created to notify an issuer if you enter a prepayment penalty amount greater than 10% of the Loan UPB. You say, why would you do that? Well... We actually had an issuer enter the, the loan UPB amount as their prepayment penalty amount. This very large error was not identified until after the fourth business day, which is after the reporting deadline. So this is a way of uh, checking that the prepayment penalty amount is the amount that um, that you intend to put for the prepayment penalty amount. The loan UPB amount on the screen is used in the calculation to determine if the prepayment penalty amount is greater than 10% of the loan UPB. If the amount entered is greater than 10%, then you receive this pop-up message, which will be displayed, stating that you should review the amount and click OK, and then save if the amount is accurate. If the amount is incorrect, click OK, enter the correct amount in the prepayment penalty amount box, and then click Save. If it's still greater than 10%, you'll get an, the pop-up again, um, and then you, you reevaluate from that point. Always make sure you click Save um, in order to uh, make sure your amounts are, are entered. Okay, that's it for prepayment penalty amounts. Um, now on to the monthly reporting certification. The monthly reporting certification opens on the 10th business day with the deadline being 7 p.m. Eastern on the 14th business day. Um, in order to navigate to this screen in my Ginny May, you click Tools and then click PAEF for Exception Feedback and then the Summary tab in gray. The monthly certification link can be found in the lower right-hand corner highlighted on this screen in red. Okay, now you, you've received this screen. If my name on the 11702 is Steve J. Audie, 
And my name on my MGM account, my My Jenny May account is Steve Audi. I would not be able to certify as my names do not match exactly. In order to complete the monthly certification as an issuer, you must be a signer on an active HUD 11702 form in MAMS. Also, the name on the HUD 11702 and on MGM account must match exactly. As in my, the example I just mentioned, my name did not match because one form had my middle initial. Okay, now for a subservicer, the issuer must be a signer on the internal issuer's HUD 11702 form and must have an active HUD 11707 form in MAMS. Okay, um, a quick story here on monthly certification. A few months ago, an issuer missed the 14th business day monthly certification deadline because the only person that had access to complete the certification was out on an unexpected medical leave. Um, therefore, a best practice is to have multiple people backups with RSA soft tokens for the monthly reporting certification process. Okay. All right, and that's that's the the uh, monthly certification process. Now another uh, additional reporting um, requirements item that we're going to cover is loan matching. So what is loan matching? Jenny May loan matching. This is an automated monthly process that electronically matches the issuer reported data to the federal agency reported data. For multifamily, that would be the USDA Rural Development Multifamily Agency data and the FHA Multifamily Agency data. We take your submitted data for those fields and match it to the agency data. If it does not match, then it appears on a download in matching and suspense. Okay, so the matching criteria. Um, the matching criteria is for FHA case number and OPB for project loans and mortgage rate for construction loans. This also applies to rural development um, and there is a two string match there. Issuers are, are asked to resolve their non-matches every month. We match on agency case number, uh, as you can see there at the bottom, which is a 15 digit case number. The format for that can be found on APM 02-17. It gives the format for all the agency case numbers. Okay, now to access your matching and suspense, uh, you would go into the My Jenny May system through the MGM portal and select in the RFS drop-down menu, the matching and suspense, abbreviated MAS, highlighted in the red box. Uh, if you use a subservicer, um, do they work matching and suspense for you? Um, I'd like to pose that as a question on the chat. So you could give a, a yes if they do work those matching and suspense for you, and no if you do the matching and suspense yourself. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you, Nick. And it may be that some of you don't have a subservicer, so this really doesn't apply. Um, all right. Very good. Okay, now uh, talking a little bit about matching and suspense errors, um, we want to uh, take a look at the, we talked about a downloads and getting the matching and suspense mismatches. Um, these errors are accessible on the downloads tab. Um, there are seven total downloads in RFS, but only three of which apply to multifamily. The insurance matching download, you will want to pull after the sixth business day. Okay. We run matching on the fifth business day, and you'll be able to see the non-matches on the sixth business day. You can make corrections between the first and the tenth business day. We'll run the matching on the 10th business day, and you can pull a download on the 11th business day to see any changes. So really, we have two different match uh, processes there, the insurance matching and the loan matching, and they occur on different days. Um, they're available the day after um, the, the period ends. Now for various loan suspense, if you submit a various loan record, you can pull the download on the seventh business day and you'll receive an e-notification if that is applicable to you. So you can see on the last two, the seventh business day and the 10th business day, you do receive e-notifications for those processes if you have suspense items. All right, now for non-matching downloads. Non-matching loan downloads. Um, you'll go into RFS and the matching and suspense module, MAS. Um, you'll see the gray boxes across the top and this is where you'll pull your downloads. Like your insurance and various suspense download. If you have any questions or guidance on the matching and suspense module, there is a user guide available as the last gray tab there. Now, a, a note on the user guide in any module within RFS, you do have a user guide. So that's available on any of the modules, just like you see here for matching and suspense. All right, now if you have suspended records, um, you'll receive a loan matching suspense e-notification and it'll look something like this. On the screen, here's an example. Um, and who has seen this type of e-notification? Um, what you can do here is you can um, either indicate in the chat or you can send a, a symbol across um, on, on Zoom if you have received it. There's a thumbs up. Thank you very much. A couple of them. All right, good. We like to see that people are looking at their e-notifications. Excellent. All right, if you look at the bottom of the e-notification, um, you'll notice that we, we give you a deadline. Um, 
We ask that you return all of your responses no later than 8, 9 a.m. Eastern time on the second to last business day of the month. This gives us time to process all of the suspense records that are responded to. Okay. Okay, now the this is a good a good slide to kind of give an overview of the of the um, matching and suspense processes. Um, the matching and suspense exceptions are are uh, accessible on the downloads tab as we just looked at. Um, we know that th only three of the downloads are applicable to multifamily. The insurance matching, you would pull on the 6th and 11th business day after we've run the matching. And there's no in, uh, no e-notification on that insurance matching. You will receive an e-notification for the various and the loan matching processes. Okay. Any questions on the matching and suspense that you can put in the chat? Um, otherwise, I will turn the next section over to Debbie. I'll give you a minute here to, um, if you have any, any questions that you want to put in the chat. Okay. Uh, it looks like it's pretty straightforward or there are no questions. So I will turn this over to Debbie for the next section. Thank you, Steve. And good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go over the custodial account verification reporting in RFS also known as CAVs. Issuers must submit CAVs between the 6th and 15th business day of March, June, September, and December per MBS Guide Chapter 16-8. And this can be submitted in RFS by manual entry or a file upload. A separate certification must be submitted for each HUD 11709 P&I account and each HUD 11720 escrow account. And if you could give me a thumbs up if you have a reminder for this quarterly CAVS reporting. It would be easy to let that go by since it's just quarterly. Ah, perfect. Excellent. All right, to navigate to CAVS and RFS, go to Pool Accounting Multifamily and click on the Quarterly Verification tab, which you see highlighted in the red box there. Inside the screen, you'll select your issuer ID, the current reporting quarter, and click Go. And a list of your accounts will appear. Click on the bank ABA number hyperlink to open the Edit Custodial Account Verification screen. Some of the account information will be pre-populated. And you can update and or add any of the required information, including the agency ratings, and click Save at the bottom of the screen. And you'll want to repeat that for all the P&I accounts and escrow accounts. And next, we're going to talk about with it. Um, in 2006, the IRS published temporary and final reporting rules for widely held fixed investment trust. 
Ginny May provides issuers a method to report required WFID data to the IRS. The standard file layout to report the IRS required widely held fixed investment trust data can be found in Appendix 6-18. And the link is at the bottom of the slide there. Data is due the 10th calendar day of April for January to March and due July for April to June, October for July to September, and January for October to December. Issuers have five days to make corrections. Issuers have the opportunity at year end to correct 13 months of data from December, December. Ginny May will publish the data on Ginny May's tax and factor reporting website. And Ginny May is prohibited from advising the public on specific tax matters. Ginny May issuers should consult their own tax advisors regarding the specific tax treatment and tax accounting of any mortgage-backed security. To access the WIFIT module within MGM, you can click Tools in the upper right-hand corner and then click on the WIFIT module. Prior to 2006, Ginny May did not provide a vehicle for issuers to report this data. At a summit, Victoria Vargas stated that Ginny May would incorporate a vehicle for issuers to report this information in Ginny May. The IRS has guidelines for reporting. You may manually report data under the issuer tab or use file upload and select WIFIT files from the down, drop down list. The WIFIT module also provides several feedback reports of the data submitted. You have the summary, exceptions, summary and detail compliance, and a late submission report. Once you've reported data through RFS, you must continue to report using RFS. Issuers must report with it, and it, issuers may use Jenny May to use to report with it. However, you do not have to. and a little about annual financial documents. An important task for issuers to perform annually is to upload your company's annual financial documents. And this is in, in accordance with MBS Guide Chapter 3 and Appendix 6-20. These documents must be uploaded into the new Jenny May Central module Financial documents are due within 90 days of the issuer's fiscal year end. And submission dates of annual documents depend on your fiscal year end. The bond and ENO insurance documents are due within 30 days of policy expiration. And you can refer to the two links we have there for more information. Now we will have our first polling question. And I think, there we go. Which screen do you use to complete the monthly reporting certification? We'll give a little time there and have as much participation as possible.
Yeah, A, RFS monthly summary. Very good. And our next polling question, what are an annual financial documents do? Very good, yep, 90 days after fiscal year end. All right. Now we're gonna take a five minute break and then we'll reconvene to continue training, which Christy will be presenting. So we can start the timer and thank you everybody, we'll see you back in five minutes. And thank you, Debbie, so much for all of that great information. So welcome back from break, everyone. So we will continue with cash and reconciliations. So reconciliation of cash is P&I and t &I accounts. This consists of your bank account statements, your internal servicing records, and the information you reported to Ginny Mae on your monthly activity, which totals are on the RFS summary screen. The keys to quality Ginny Mae monthly reporting are following the MBS Guide Chapter 16 for custodial accounts, have Jenny May program knowledge, reconciliations, test, and internal servicing controls. Cash management includes Jenny May's access to draft funds from your account following Chapter 16 custodial account requirements, funding P&I shortfalls, completing monthly tests of expected P&I recons, reconciling mortgage collateral to securities outstanding, also known as full to security, and completing monthly bank account recons. Miscellaneous items would include, but are not limited to, payment querying and disbursement querying internal recons. Please give me a thumbs up if you perform your bank account recuts. Wonderful. See some thumbs. Thank you so much. Please ensure that there are not any restrictions that would impact Jenny May's ability to draft funds from the central P&I accounts on draft days. Ensuring that there are not ACH debit blocks, issuers should have a procedure in place for communicating with Jenny May and the Bank of New York Mellon, its CPTA, if any problems arise. This includes guarantee fee drafts. Another best practice is one business day prior to the draft. Ensure that the account is fully funded and there are no issues. Confirm funds have been drafted from the account on the day of the scheduled draft. If funds are not drafted, <clears throat> excuse me, directly contact your bank. Also provide your Ginny Mae account executive a plan to remedy the draft failure. Give me a thumbs up if your company has a process to ensure that your ACH bank accounts are fully funded on the day of the draft. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a lot of thumbs. That's great. 
Absolutely great. If your company does not have a process for this, please ensure that one is created. Your collections querying account or payment querying is an optional account. This account can be used for GenyMe and non GenyMe funds. This account needs to transfer to GenyMe PNI and TNI accounts within one business day. You may recover corporate advances provided excess funds are restored to the custodial account from this account. Also, this should be a zero balance account, which means you should be able to show the detail of every cent that is outstanding in this bank account each day. For liquidations, the clock starts when uh, from the post date, date of deposit on the bank statement. Since issuers do not post payments received after hours until the next business day, they have one business day from the date of the post um, or deposit. Ultimately, the funds must be deposited into the Ginny May PNI account within two business days of receiving the funds. Here is the PNI custodial account requirements. This account can be Ginny May funds only. It must be a single, non interest bearing custodial account. It may contain funds for more than one pool. A HUD 11709 form must exist for each account, which is part of the master agreements. It must be maintained at an ACH capable financial institution. The bank account recons must be completed timely, which is within 30 days of your Ginny May cutoff date. And it must meet the CAVS bank rating requirements. If you have a PNI disbursement account, here are the requirements. You may use a separate disbursement account. It must be non interest bearing and a zero balance account. It must be maintained at an ACH capable financial institution. It must only contain Ginny May funds, so no commingling allowed. It may be for one uh, Ginny May issuer ID per account. And a master agreement, HUD 11709 form, must exist for this account. Now, the TNI custodial bank account requirements. This account may be interest bearing. It does not have to earn interest, but it may. This account must only contain Ginny May funds. It must have a HUD 11720 form for each account in the master agreements. Just like the PNI accounts, the TNI bank recon must be completed timely, uh, which is within 30 days of the issuer's cutoff. It must have a separate custodial account for 203K FHA funds and separate escrow accounts for any FHA or RD USDA requirements for other funds. PNI accounts are subject to custodial account verifications, also known as CAPS. It is required when the total FIC payments are equal to or greater than $100,000 per month per Appendix 619. Also, project loan escrow accounts for any project equally equal to or exceeding $100,000 require CAVS reporting. Per the agency rating requirements, institutions are required to meet at least one of the following. Institutions serving as funds custodian with assets of 30 billion or more must have either a short-term rating by SNP of A3 or better, 
a long term by SNP of triple B or better. Short term deposit rating by Moody's of P3 or better or a long-term deposit rating by Moody's of BAA3 or better. 30 billion or less asset institutions must have an IDC rating of 125 or better, or a Kroll rating of a C plus or better. Depository institutions must meet the following three requirements, must be insured by FDIC or NCUSIF, must be rated as well capitalized by its federal or state regula uh, regulator, regulator, and have a rating that meets or exceeds at least one of the agency rating requirements specified. CAVS is due quarterly, in March, June, September, and December between the 6th and 15th business days. PI temporary short call shortfalls may be caused by mortgage or late payments or NSF checks from mortgagers and incorrect advance calculations, just to name a few. Here are a few non-recoverable corporate advance permanent shortfalls, including but not limited to adjustments, loan removals, and TNI shortfalls. The loan payoff shortfalls for FHA loans may be the difference in the liquidation interest paid by the borrower and the remaining interest due through the end of the month that needs to be funded to your PNI account. Companies can use their own funds as corporate advances. Excess funds, which are uns unscheduled recoveries of principal on pools, which may be found in MBS Guide Chapter 15-5, or the pool advance agreement using bank funds, and also Appendix 6-1 must be completed. If you use corporate advances to fund your PNI shortfalls, ensure you advance the funds to the PNI account prior to the Jenny May ACH draft on the 15th calendar day. Ensure you recover the corporate advances properly and document all advances. To calculate corporate advances, Take your PNI bank balance minus additional principal payments and liquidations not passed through until the following month, minus prepaid installments and guarantee fee, which gives you the adjusted bank balance. Then subtract the amount due to security holders. An overage is a positive number and a shortage is a negative number. Excess funds are scheduled or unscheduled recoveries of principal on the pools and prepayments. Please see MBS Guide Chapter 15-5. I will now turn it over to Melanie. Thank you, Christy. Uh, corporate advances using excess funds are unapplied funds, service fees, and pools sharing the same custodial account. Corporate advances using excess funds are calculated by taking the P&I bank balance minus guarantee fees, and this will give you the adjusted bank balance. Okay, then subtract the amount due to security holders and the results will reflect a positive number for a bank overage and a negative number for a bank shortage. Please give me a thumbs up if you review your test of expected P&I. Thank you, good. 
Great. Thanks so much. A test of expected PNI provides the uh, PNI account minimum dollar amount and all pool cash shortages funded by the issuer. It is required on every pool and performed monthly by the issuer. Uh, when performing test of expected PNI, keep in mind you may not net pools that have ca cash overages with pools that have cash shortages. Uh, best practice would be uh, fund your PNI account for any positive differences in one transaction, then withdraw funds from your PNI account uh, for any negative differences in a separate transaction. Uh, for audit purposes, you should retain uh, pool level documentation of these transactions. Okay, so here is a test of expected uh, PNI recon. Most servicing systems will complete a similar test of expected PNI recon report uh, like the one displayed here. Well, please note the test of expected calculation is only accurate once the pull to security recon is zero. Okay, so give me a thumbs up if you review your recon of mortgage collaterals to securities outstanding, uh, also called the pull to security recon. I'm looking for thumbs up. Oh, there they are. If you review your pull to security recon. Okay, good. Thank you for the thumbs. So the, the pull to security recon is required on every pool and performed by the issuer or by your servicing system. If your pool is um, over collateralized, the adjusted pool principal balance is larger than the securities balance and you'll need to recover unscheduled principal from liquidations or curtailments. Now, there is a tolerance of up to $100 per pool if there are no unscheduled recoveries of principal. Now, if the pool is under collateralized, this means the adjusted pool principal balance is less than the securities balance and you'll need to remit principal, uh, most likely by a corporate advance. There is a tolerance of $1 per loan per pool with a maximum tolerance of $50 per pool. And also with these being multifamily pools, uh, each project is different. Therefore, if you have passed through too much money and you now have a pool to security difference, please contact your Ginny Mae multifamily account executive uh, for guidance. Okay, and here we have a pool to security recon. Uh, most servicing systems will complete a similar uh, pool to security recon like the one displayed here. Okay, and here we have a sample format of a PNI account recon. Most issuers build their PNI recon form in Excel. Your bank recons must be completed within 30 days of the issuer's monthly reporting cutoff date. Uh, the cash flow method is the balance at the end of the previous month plus daily deposits minus disbursements. Uh, the total should equal the ending PNI cash book balance. This balance is reported in field 12 of the pool record and is also displayed at the bottom of the pool screen. An important note, all adjusting items on the recon must be resolved within one of the next two reporting cycles. So if you have outstanding unreconciled items it may result in an audit finding. Okay, and here is a sample format of a TNI account recon. Uh, like the PNI recon, most issuers usually build this form in Excel. And just like the PNI recon, uh, the TNI bank account recon must be completed within 30 days of the issuer's monthly reporting cutoff date. A TNI funds be deposited in a Ginny Mae escrow account within two business days or 48 hours of pool settlement. 
the escrow balance for individual loans is reported on the pool level, excuse me, on the pool record. Uh, field 11 of the pool record reflects the total escrow of all loans within the pool. An important note, all adjusting items on the recon must be completely resolved with one of the next two reporting cycles. Okay, so the large red box as shown here on the pool activity screen, this displays the bank account balances that are reported on the pool level. And these balances can be reported on your RFS file um, or issuers can enter them manually online. Issuers must click on the save and summarize pool button at the bottom of the screen when any information on this screen is updated. Um, or if any of the loan fields are updated, you must also save and summarize as this process, uh, it moves certain loan level information to the pool screen behind the scenes. And if you click on the small uh, plus sign in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, the custodial bank account information is displayed. Okay, and here in the custodial bank uh, information fields, uh, this is where you may update your bank account numbers and the ABA routing numbers. Again, ensure you click on save and summarize pull button if you've made any updates screen. And we have a, a polling question. What is the time limit to complete bank reconciliation? What's the time limit to complete your bank recon? 20 days from remittance, 30 days from your cutoff, or 60 days from month in. I give everyone enough time to enter their response. Okay, great, yes. The correct answer is B, uh, 30 days from your cutoff. All right, our next polling question. Um, when is an issuer required to submit custodial account verification? When is an issuer required to submit that CAVS verification? Is it every month? Um, is it when your bank has at least 100,000 in deposits? Or is it when the FIC equals 100,000 or more? Christy went over this earlier. I believe it was Christy. Okay, and the correct answer is actually C. Uh, when your FIC equals 100,000 or more, that's when you are required uh, to submit custodial account verification. Okay, and our last question here, uh, what is the purpose of the pool to security recon, also called uh, reconciliation of mortgage collateral to security outstanding? Uh, what's the purpose of your pull to security recon? <laughs> I don't know. Does it notify your issuers of collateral to security discrepancies? Um, or does it notify issuers to fund the bank account? And keep in mind of the name. It's the reconciliation of mortgage collateral to the security outstanding. What's the purpose of pull to security? Oh, 
Okay, great. Yes, uh, the majority of you got that answer correct. Uh, it notifies uh, issuers of any collateral to security discrepancies. Yes. Okay, so this slide here uh, shows a list of best practices for issuers. A few things to keep in mind. Again, 100% of pool and loan data must be reported by close of business on the second business day. All E and C level exceptions related to the pool and loan records must be cleared no later than 7 p.m. Eastern time on the fourth business day. Uh, there should be a consistently consistent, consistency um, of data report in RFS. Uh, the case number reported on loan record should match the case number reported at origination. Uh, if not, that record will be suspended. Uh, issuers are fully responsible for meeting reporting timelines and uh, are also responsible for the accuracy of the data reported by your subservicers. Okay, uh, adhering to your company's established cutoff date. It's also a best practice. Uh, you want to ensure uh, the correct liquidation removal reason code is reported in RFS. It's very important. Uh, analyze and correct RFS exceptions per severity level uh, requirements and deadlines. Review e-notifications daily. And lastly, as uh, we mentioned earlier, have multiple backups with RSA tokens for the monthly reporting certification. Okay, now does anyone have any questions? Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat or you can unmute your mic. And also, um, do any of the Ginny May account executives have anything to add? This is Krista. I do not. Um, I don't know if any of the group does. Michelle. I, mean. I just wanted to say good afternoon to everyone, um, but I do not have anything else to add. Okay. And I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, so we're going to close out here. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I will turn it over to the host.